Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The following presentation represents uh, a demonstration of laboratory procedures involved in blood coagulation and in the evaluation of hemostasis. The routine procedures available in most hospitals are designed to provide information on specific aspects of the clotting process and include the following categories. Platelet vascular, which would include a platelet count, the Rumpel-Lady test, bleeding time, and measurements of platelet aggregation and adhesiveness. Plasma clotting tests would include the prothrombin time, the partial thromboplastin time. Heparin antithrombin uh, tests would include a simple thrombin clotting time. And lastly, clot lysis, which would be measured by the euglobulin lysis time. Fibrin split products uh, also would be included in our measurements. Platelets are the first element of hemostasis that we will evaluate. As you can see, this cytoplasmic fragment derived from the megakaryocyte in the marrow is approximately one-fifth the size of a red blood cell and can be counted by methods utilizing the phase microscope. The platelets are prepared by diluting the patient's blood in ammonium oxalate and plating the suspension onto a counting chamber. After a three-minute settling period, the chamber is placed under the scope and the platelets identified and counted. As you can see, the morphology of the platelet varies. However, all contain granular areas and have a distinct cell boundary. The first procedure that can be done at the bedside is the Rumpel-Leedy test or tourniquet test. This employs a blood pressure cuff applied to the upper arm. And as a matter of fact, this can be done during the routine physical exam and at the time the blood pressure is recorded. When the blood pressure has been recorded, the cuff is reinflated to 80 millimeters of mercury and left in that, at that point for five minutes while other aspects of the physical exam are attended to. At the end of five minutes, the cuff is deflated and removed. And the arm is lifted above heart level to allow venous congestion to decompress. And then it's returned to working area and inspection of the volar aspect of the forearm is accomplished. Now there may be a few petechiae in the upper arm at the lower edge of where the cuff was and these are disregarded. Only those between the elbow and the wrist are looked for. If an occasional petechiae is present, that's considered one plus. Two plus is when there's a dozen or so in this area, but still a countable number. Three plus is when there's an innumerable number in this area, and four plus is when the hand is involved in addition to the volar aspect of the forearm. In any case, a positive rumpelidi or a positive tourniquet test indicates either vascular fragility or significant thrombocytopenia. A test for vascular fragility and significant thrombocytopenia is the bleeding time. This is done using a blood pressure cuff, which is inflated to 40 millimeters of mercury. And the object of the pressure is to provide a continuous back pressure on the venous system and capillary system and to standardize the test. The test is performed by puncturing the skin of the forearm using a micro lancet and then taking the drop of blood that forms and letting it be absorbed by the edge of a piece of filter paper every 30 seconds. Now we're speeding that up here for demonstration purposes. In actual practice, the drop of blood would be removed every 30 seconds. This is not a measure of the ability of blood to clot 
but rather it's a measure of the vascular fragility. We have here a normal test, which has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine dots on it, which would have been placed there every 30 seconds. The test would then be four and a half minutes in length. Normal is less than five minutes. This shows a distinctly abnormal test from someone would, who had severe thrombocytopenia. Clot retraction represents another function of the platelets that is easily measured. Our technologist has separated platelet-rich plasma by centrifugation. The plasma has been placed in a graduated centrifuge tube and platelet lipid has been added to provide sufficient platelet factor three for clot formation. Finally, calcium is added to produce a firm clot. After gentle mixing, an applicator stick is added to provide a point of attachment for the clot. Thirty minutes of incubation at 37 degrees provides sufficient time for clot retraction to complete itself. The clotted tubes are examined and the clot then is removed. The residual serum expressed from the clot is measured by determining the level of fluid in the tube. Ordinarily, 80% of the serum is expressed from the clot if platelet function is normal and at least 100,000 platelets per cubic millimeter are present. The first tube had approximately 50,000 platelets per cubic millimeter, and retraction is less effective as compared to the second tube with a normal number of platelets. Occasionally, as seen in the third tube, the clot does not adhere to the stick and the test may not, must be repeated. Another aspect of platelet function can be measured by determining the ability of the platelets to clump or aggregate when exposed to various agents such as adenosine diphosphate, collagen, and epinephrine. Prepared platelet-rich plasma is inserted into the instrument. Platelets will aggregate after the addition of these reagents and produce an interference in the light source. This information is transmitted to a recording device to form a specific pattern, as indicated in the following charts. Adenosine diphosphate produces immediate clumping in the normal while platelets from patients with hereditary and acquired defects, such as thrombocytopathia, respond very poorly. Collagen also produces aggregation, as the platelets stick to the collagen fibrils that are introduced into the platelet-rich plasma. This is a normal phenomena, but after aspirin and other drugs, the platelets fail to adhere, and the pattern is abnormal with much less of a response uh, after the addition of the collagen. Epinephrine, another of the reagents added, produces some immediate clumping, followed by a release of the intrinsic platelet adenosine diphosphate, thus resulting in a second wave pattern. Aspirin and various drugs also impede this release of adenosine diphosphate, as seen in the abnormal response uh, noted here. And the absence of the second wave is obvious. Von Willebrand's disease, uh, another uh, abnormality of platelet function, uh, also demonstrates this inhibition of the second wave phenomena and has an abnormal pattern with the addition of collagen. The prothrombin time was one of the first modifications of the Lee White clotting time. As shown, tissue thromboplastin and a calcium reagent, two-tenths of an ml, are added to plasma, one-tenth of an ml. Both reagents and plasma are pre-warmed to 37 degrees centigrade. Clotting is then timed mechanically or manually 
as will be demonstrated. And should provide a normal clotting time of approximately 12 to 14 seconds. This procedure measures the extrinsic clotting mechanism and is primarily sensitive to factors 7 and 10. The partial thromboplastin assay is another modification of the Lee-White clotting time. It represents a measurement of the intrinsic coagulation system and requires the addition of a plated lipid substitute combined usually with an activator of factor 12, the Hageman factor, and calcium to plasma. All reagents in plasma are pre-warmed to 37 degrees centigrade. The platelet lipid and activator are added and incubated for a period of three minutes before the final addition of calcium. The clotting time is then determined manually or mechanically as shown. A number of plasma factor activities are measured in this procedure, including factors 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. It should be noted that the period of incubation with the activator is critical and will affect the final clotting time. The fibrinogen assay is based on the relationship of the fibrinogen level to the clotting time. Within a given range, the lower the level of fibrinogen, the longer the clotting time. The procedure requires that plasma be diluted to the proper range in buffer, as shown. Normal plasma has diluted 1 to 10 in buffer. Two tenths of an ml of dilute plasma is then placed in a cuvette. and in turn placed in the instrument. Thrombin, one-tenth of an ml, is then injected into the cuvette and the clotting time determined. The clotting time, which was obtained approximately six seconds, is then compared to a standard curve, and the fibrinogen levels read out as milligrams per cent. The time in seconds against the fibrinogen level in milligrams per cent. Plasma with decreased levels of fibrinogen require less dilution, thus dilution with buffer perhaps of one to four or one to two would be required with fibrinogen levels of 40 to 60 milligrams per cent. The results obtained with this lesser dilution require that a division be made with the appropriate factor. Heparin can be measured in terms of its major activity, antithrombin. The thrombin clotting time measures antithrombin by a relatively simple procedure, as shown. Plasma, two-tenths of an ml, is placed in the cuvette. A thrombin calcium solution, one-tenth of an ml, is injected into the cuvette and the clotting time determined. In addition to heparin, the presence of fibrin split products 
which have anathrombin activity, or a deficiency of fibrinogen also can prolong the thrombin clotting time. The sample shown contains heparin, producing a clotting time of 20 seconds, which is equivalent to two-tenths of a unit of heparin. When protamine sulfate is added to the sample, as illustrated, heparin activity is neutralized and the clotting time returns to normal, a value of approximately nine seconds. The euglobulin lysis time provides a measurement of fibrinolysin activity. The euglobulin fraction is precipitated from whole blood by the addition of cold acetic acid, followed by a 10-minute incubation at 5 degrees centigrade. The precipitate that is formed is put into solution by diluting it with buffer, as shown. Thrombin is then added to this solution, and a clot will form immediately. The tube is then incubated at 37 degrees, and the clot inspected at 30 minute intervals to determine the extent of lysis. As shown here, partial lysis has occurred. A small clot remains in the tube. Hemostasis is essential to any surgical effort. Uh, for body, the body's protection, there must be an adequate hemostatic mechanism at work. This mechanism is generally considered in two phases, a vascular phase and a coagulation phase. The blood vessels that have been opened up by the laceration, whether it is accidental or whether it's intended through surgical effort, these blood vessels have to respond by contracting, and then within the contracted vessel, the marvels of hemostasis through coagulation mechanism must proceed through its sequence of events that finally bring out the formation of a blood clot. The reasons for control of hemorrhage are twofold in surgery. They are during the operative phase, when you have to see what you're doing, and that where extravasation of blood gets in your way, camouflages your field, you have to keep it out of the way. One does that by aspiration, by suction, but this tends to pull more blood away and tends to keep blood vessels open instead of having them closed. So we intermittently, through our surgery, try to keep bleeding under control through local hemostasis measures. These are chiefly applications of pressure now, this pressure varies from the utilization of sponges 
Ordinary gauze sponges are used for compression, and we make uh, small rolls of these and insert them over areas where we hope to control bleeding. For example, if the tooth is missing after the extraction here in this typodont, we would place a gauze roll firmly and insert it uh, into this region, packing it in position, having the patient bite down on it. Whenever we leave a field in surgery, uh, we have a patient apply pressure uh, by biting down on sponges. The wounds in oral surgery are particularly uh, productive of hemostasis problem because the vascular bed, when you take out a tooth, uh, is complex. There's no wound quite like this one. The bleeding is coming from the bone where the vessels are torn open and the bleeding is coming from the soft tissues around the periphery. So you have really in the bone vessels that cannot adequately contract and the tearing of the soft tissue, you have a very complex wound and the normal physiologic measures of control of bleeding are really taxed by this wound. This is why many borderline bleeding tendencies uh, due to vascular abnormality or due to coagulation defect abnormalities are unmasked or are exposed when a tooth is taken out because of the complexity of that uh, disruption of blood vessels. Well, if there, there are a number of other measures that can be used for control of bleeding that are pressure applications, the hemostat is uh, named for its local role in controlling bleeding. Uh, it has a blunt nose. It, they are curved and straight. This happens to be a curved hemostat. Uh, it opens and is able to clamp on a vessel. If you have a vessel that's large enough, if a palatal flap is reflected and the major palatine is, artery is there, you can get a hold of it if it has a severed end and you can clamp that end off. Uh, that in itself will stop that soft tissue bleed. The small capillaries from most soft tissue wounds are usually too small. It is only arterial bleeding that generally can be uh, amenable to the use of a hemostat uh, and you can then clamp that and then follow it with more pressure through the application of ligatures. Sutures can then be tied around the hemostat or a suture can be passed, a needle pass, a so-called stick tie to uh, establish that control of a major uh, arterial bleed. In the event that the bleeding is welling up from this socket, from down here where there's uh, a tear in a vascular abnormality, uh, that tends to keep coming up. There are a number of measures you can use to control that. The closed end of the hemostat can be penetrated down directly over the bleeding area and with pressure you can crush the adjacent bone matrix into the vessel opening and that will tend to control and stop it. If for some reason that is ineffective in controlling it, you can follow it up with other measures of obtunding or plugging the openings. Among those are a material called bone wax, which is uh, an absorbable uh, yet uh, uh, material that will mechanically give us the, uh, you can see it's packaged in this form. I've torn open the end of the package. We can take a small amount of it and put it on the end of a periosteal elevator uh, such as we see here. And this material is, tends to be soft. You can get just the quantity that you need and it can then be placed down into the area and pushed into the porous areas of bone and in that way plug those areas of porosity. That is bone wax. It can be left there. It generally is followed with pressure with a, a sponge for control. There are some situations where in the middle of a procedure you have a root tip that's broken off down there. There's a lot of bleeding around it and you can't see it and you'd like to slow up that bleeding. The suction is not enough and you want to control it. Well, you can pack a sponge down in there, a plain sponge, just by making a wick of the end of a sponge, stretching it out and twisting it in this manner and pick it up with the end of a cotton plier and pack it down firmly 
into the area and hold it there or have the patient hold it there by closing on that. Uh, or you can add the chemical actions of a topical vasopressor by using adrenaline. Uh, this is one to 1,000 adrenaline, unlike the material that you use in local anesthetic solutions. This, of course, is concentrated, and one must respect this concentration of adrenaline. It either comes in this ampule form or in a stock bottle uh, that uh, is brown and uh, because it does deteriorate with light. And if you take this material and again make the small wick and saturate the tip of this wick uh, in topical adrenaline and then pack this down after it's wrung out, pack that into the socket area, one will then get the effect of the direct vasoconstriction of a concentrated 1 to 1,000 adrenaline solution on that vasculature. And that can be quite helpful in shrinking the blood vessels, causing them to contract and allow uh, small thrombi to form in their ends to seal off the ruptured vessels. So that is a method that you can use during the time that you're operating. Now, when it comes to the end of a procedure, some of the usual forms of hemostasis are once again pressure. And as soon as you have the teeth out and the other trimming done in an area of extraction, begin right then to use pressure. And don't keep sucking out these areas, but again, put gauze in there and have the patient bite down. And as an assistant, use pressure uh, to clear the field of any blood rather than the sucker as you're closing. Now, in the closing process, of course, sutures in themselves afford pressure on torn soft tissues. And this uh, very mechanical uh, measure of applying sutures to soft tissue margins tends to affect hemostasis. So one is careful about your application of sutures so that they firmly hold the tissue into position. There's a paradox about suturing in that if sutures are placed too tightly, they may tend to stretch the soft tissues so that the blood vessels are actually kept open. Generally speaking, all sutures tend to apply the right pressure and affect hemostasis. The, in the event that there still is some capillary ooze coming from a bone defect where teeth have been removed or pathology has been removed, there are other materials that are useful for additional topical hemostasis. These are uh, products that are absorbable. One of them is in the form of oxidized cellulose. Oxidized cellulose is absorbable. It comes either in this gauze form, which uh, we've opened up another one here to show you the texture of this material, either in this gauze form. And that can be rolled up into a tight roll again placed into the socket with a cotton plier as a tampon and pressed down firmly into position. And that can often then be backed up with a sponge. Uh, it turns black, actually, in contact with serum and blood. Uh, and it is absorbable. It's packed and left there. Oxidized cellulose is also put up in a form of a cone, a compressed material, which expands considerably when it picks up blood. But these cones can also be inserted into defects and maintain, uh, be maintained there because they are absorbable. Another of the chemical adjuncts to uh, local hemostasis uh, can be gained in the use of other foam products. Uh, gelatin can be placed in a, in a foam uh, product. This is commercial gel foam. This material can be uh, compressed and used as a vehicle to carry other solutions. Often topical thrombin can be uh, used in this manner and firmly placed down into a socket as another measure to control bleeding. Uh, the patient who returns to your office after an extraction with a bleeding problem, with prolonged bleeding, needs careful evaluation. Most of the bleeding problems that you will see are due to trauma. Either a blood vessel has been torn, bone has been fractured and sprung out, 
to hold vessels open and keep them from contracting. These are the most common causes, our trauma. Uh, the second common cause is that of hypertension, the amount of pressure that's behind the patient's vascular system that keeps the pressure up and keeps the torn vessels open. This is another cause for prolonged bleeding. Uh, infection can tend to either cause tissues to be inflamed originally and be dilated, therefore, or it can, infection, because of fibrinol lysins and other bacterial products, can tend to break down blood clots and cause secondary bleeding. Uh, these are some of the causes for the patient who returns with bleeding and which you will have to then evaluate. Last but not least among the aspects of bleeding are the true disorders, either of the vascular system or of the coagulation system. And as we said at the outset, it's the extraction wound that often will unmask and cause a trouble uh, to be diagnosed through that complication where the patient in soft tissue wounds has had enough uh, adequacy in their hemostatic mechanisms uh, to get along all right, but you challenge them with an extraction wound and they have prolonged bleeding. When you see such a patient, you have to assess the amount of blood loss, make sure it's not excessive, make sure they're not going into shock, and then approach them. Most patients tend to be alarmed after bleeding from the mouth. They, this is all magnified in volume. And so they will uh, be quite anxious. It's well to reassure them. After you've taken their blood pressure and made sure they're not in shock, uh, then you can utilize uh, tranquilizing and sedating agents to calm them down a little bit. And if you have to go back, you put pressure over the site that's bleeding. If you have to go back in there, it's best to reanesthetize so you don't uh, cause them to additional pain as you're removing sutures and packing in materials. Uh, in the control of bleeding, we haven't mentioned thermal methods of hemostasis. Cautery can be used in operative surgery to uh, close off vessels by direct thermal electrical cautery. And also, cold can be used in the form of packs. We often make up uh, packs, ice bags uh, of this order and have the patient hold them on the side of their face in order to control traumatic edema. And this also, in effect, induces some reflex vasoconstriction, cuts down the blood supply to the part that's bleeding, and allows the normal hemostatic mechanisms enough time uh, to do their thing and to close off and establish the thrombi that are part of the initial phases of healing. Occasionally, around the mouth and jaws, there are real spurters. Areas of abnormal uh, vasculature, these are common in the mandible, in the nutrient canals in the symphysis area, and in areas in the posterior canal region. Bleeding from the nose may be encountered and can be a particularly difficult problem. Uh, in order to control that, we use either anterior nasal packs that are Vaseline packs, and this simply applies pressure again. These are in cans and are, uh, in this manner, uh, folded up and carried in in a uh, linear fashion, and the nose is packed one side at a time, and the mucosa that is lacerated is, again, compressed against the bony walls to control the bleeding. A post-nasal pack is required in some instances of gross trauma with fractures of the maxilla, uh, but it's rare that you'll encounter a need for that. Well, with this review, we've tried to demonstrate then some of the simple measures uh, of local control of bleeding uh, through certain adjuncts, most of them combinations of pressure and the use of tamponing materials of one sort or another in controlling uh, bleeding both during uh, surgery and uh, encountering a post-traumatic uh, or post-surgical bleeding episode. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.